Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Petros Bavasikas. I'm the director of the undergraduate uh, Bachelor of Arts in Architectural Studies program at the Daniels faculty. And I'll be providing a, a short introduction to today's uh, info session on the design build uh, courses that we will be offering this summer to our undergraduate students. Um, we have with us uh, the instructors of these courses, uh, Chloe Town, Nicholas Hoban, and Robert Rayner. Thank you for joining this section. Uh, uh, who will be, uh, after my introduction, doing a short presentation explaining to you what their courses are about, um, how they might work, uh, and, and uh, what their plan is for the respective summer terms in which they will be offered. And um, I can also give you, in this introduction, a framework for uh, how these also work in relation to other summer courses that we're offering, uh, application processes, deadlines, all this information. Uh, Tina Yik from Office of the Registrar and Student Services, who has been supporting this process very effectively, and thank you, Tina, has just pasted on our chat the link to the course description. So all of the information you really need about the courses can be found there on that link on the chat. So I would encourage you to click on it if you're, um, and, and to revisit it uh, because there's information about the courses, there's short descriptions, there's uh, application deadlines, uh, dates, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as we begin, I also wanted to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, our meeting place is still home to many Indigenous peoples from across the island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Um, so, you might have also heard me introduce the other uh, courses, our summer studio abroad, our summer abroad courses, our, and uh, our study abroad courses, and uh, our design research internship yesterday and on Tuesday. So apologies if there's a repetition in what you will hear, but I, this is still out there uh, for those who might have not heard it. Um, this is a suite of courses that we can generally describe uh, as experiential learning opportunities for you, in which uh, whether you travel to a city across the world uh, or whether you engage in a um, research uh, project with uh, an active practice, uh, professional practice in Toronto, um, or whether you participate in a team that will design and construct a structure uh, in our faculty and or in uh, Toronto's public space, um, you have the chance uh, to be part of an intensive hands-on experience. These are different ways of learning by making, of research through making. Um, there are extra courses in our, you know, in your regular program uh, that I find have been very impactful in really broadening your scope and influencing uh, how you learn and study and perceive architecture. These courses can help you de really define what your agenda is, what your interest, what your focus within uh, your study or in our liberal arts program might be, or one, one of your many different uh, interests could be. So there, as we've been offering them for the past few years, uh, and in almost a mini program, a, a suite, let's call it, since last year, um, we've really been receiving extremely positive feedback and we've also seen students who are taking their lessons from uh, Berlin uh, or from uh, building with wood or uh, from researching uh, specific um, works in Toronto into their future classes, into their research projects. Uh, and uh, from my understanding, they've been very successful. Uh, so this is an important thing to say. The other thing to say is that the courses are offered 
as a suite and therefore you apply to them through an online form as a unit. You apply to all of them through the same form and you rank your preferences and your interest in the different uh, opportunities um, based on what you want to do uh, and based on your schedule this summer. Uh, you may be, that means you can also apply to multiple opportunities to more than one, but it would still be good to know which one is really the one you would uh, like to take as a first uh, as a first chance. The application deadline is Monday, uh, February 19th. So that's uh, pretty soon. It's in about 10 days, a bit longer than 10 days. Um, we require you to submit a statement of interest for this particular course that you're applying to. We require you uh, to send us a short uh, CV just to really understand who you are and what your journey has been, what your experiences have been. It doesn't have to be a professional CV necessarily. You're not applying for a job, uh, but mostly an academic CV. And also five work samples, which should be student work, uh, work that you have completed in your studio so far, or can be uh, also uh, related work that you might have completed in co-curricular or extracurricular projects. Um, but again, these samples will really give us a sense of who you are and what you're interested in, and also what your skills are in terms of being a match to the course. Um, what else? Um, the you will be receiving answers for your application to the course about a month later, around uh, March twentieth uh, or so, after your applications, because your applications will be evaluated and organized by uh, various members of our faculty, so that we make sure you, you ideally get placed in your first choice at least, um, or if that's not possible, uh, in one of your top choices for study this summer. Um, and uh, I think this is my general introduction. Um, there will be a chance to ask questions in the chat, ideally, after you hear the presentations of each one of our instructors uh, to, about specific courses or about the framework and application process and everything. I imagine that you might have also asked very similar questions if you attended the, the previous info sessions. So perhaps uh, we won't need to repeat too much of that, too much of the logistics. Um, so I guess we'll hear from Chloe first, and I want to make sure you can share your screen. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll just jump in with uh, sharing my screen. Just give me one second. And everyone can see that. Right, thank you. Uh, so for this uh, the summer studio that I'm uh, gonna lead, it will be a design build uh, that will take place at the Daniels Building and uh, the Toronto Island. Uh, today, the island is primarily known as a park or a recreational parkland. Um, and we will be visiting between July 8th and the 29th. So in the middle of the summer. Um, and we'll be visiting alongside thousands of other visitors, uh, Torontonians and tourists alike. Uh, the island, in fact, has about 1.4 uh, million day trippers annually. We will take the ferry, just as people have done for the past uh, over 100 years, um, to escape you know, the city's heat, humidity, congestion, and just to spend time on Lake Ontario which uh, because of how, you know, essentially relatively flat the terrain is of downtown Toronto, the rail corridor, the Gardner Expressway, um, there's just a bunch of things that make it very hard sometimes to kind of feel spatially connected to uh, the, the waterfront. And we will aim to just spend some time at the shores. Um, but for us, the island is gonna be more than just uh, a recreational destination. Our interest will lie on the interstitial space between the parkland and the city. So on and across the water, um, that sort of liminal terrain between the built and the natural world. 
So essentially at the edge, the riparian edge, uh, we will be looking north to the Toronto skyline and we will consider how the island is already a kind of uh, viewing platform. So over time across the, the, the shores of Toronto Island, it's always provided kind of a hemmed in framed view of, of the Toronto against the natural world. So here, for example, we see Mises TD towers in the distance before they were obscured further um, by construction before even the CN Tower was, was yet built. But this is why I think that this is a rich uh, site for a design build uh, studio. So I think that students who are interested in architecture, urbanism, landscape architecture, um, as well as just uh, recording change over time, um, you'll be asked to think about your work in relation to the natural world, but more importantly, in real space. Um, so we will be building on sand and compacted earth uh, rather than concrete. Uh, we will walk along the water's edge, uh, taking note of the view and consider how sight lines are framed, but also just how uh, movement is uh, choreographed um, and we will sort of ask questions about how people are encouraged to move right now or linger or not. So we'll look at space that's been constructed already. Um, and sort of like this, you can see to the right, an open air pavilion and ask questions about uh, what's being used, what's perhaps underused, what things are right, um, what things can be improved upon. Because this rather bucolic image um, doesn't tell the full story of Toronto Island, which is that it has a long history of flooding. Boardwalks have been destroyed by storms before, so lashing wind and roiling water, and this continues to be the case today. So this photo really illustrates how building permanent structures um, on a low-lying uh, shoreline comes with inherent uh, risks. And it's part of the reason why in the late 1960s, Metro Toronto uh, demolished uh, hundreds of citizens' houses and cottages. So this image that you might've already seen um, is an aerial photograph from 1956. And you can see the faint outline, the dashed line and the green in within it is the whole area that was once built up houses on streets that is, was turned into parkland. And then more specifically, we're going to look to Ward's Island. So that's at the eastern edge. And the, the mix of the buildings that remain there, the houses that are still there, and some areas that are just uh, remain sort of park proper. Because currently on wards, there are about 650 people who live there uh, year round. Um, they, were, they managed to keep their homes because of activism, but they still face a kind of uh, threat today that is not politically uh, motivated, not through eminent domain, but just the water itself wanting to to perhaps take over Toronto Island. And with no permanent uh, flood protection yet in place, uh, the city is facing in real time, uh, a kind of a, a question of prioritizing what's gonna happen. So the, the flooding that happens on Toronto Island is, is both natural, but it's also political. So there are organizations along the St. Lawrence Seaway that essentially, um, through a series of dams are able to uh, decide on the level of the water in Ontario, Lake Ontario. So that's one of their jobs is to sort of consistently monitor the water levels. But that changes along the St. Lawrence Seaway has happened before uh, flood, flood uh, barrier protections have been in place. So in 2017, there was a uh, significant uh, Flood, flooding on, these are images from wards, and it happened again in 2019. So the public space at the edge of the island 
is uh, slowly being taken over. So to solve this, the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, called the TRCA, has undertaken a series of studies where they show the difference between uh, a meter rise in the water table uh, should the dams be stopped. So here we see it at 75.3 meters and what happens um, if there is a torrential rains coupled with uh, dams closed closer to Montreal. And it's these images that particularly interest me as a starting point for the studio. The suggestions, it's not going to be built this summer, it probably will be built next year, where we see a berm in yellow, a line, and then beyond it, a proposed beach front. Um, and I'll probably uh, have the TRCA, a representative, uh, give a lecture or talk to the studio. But I was looking at this image, especially sort of the figure of the beach, and it reminded me quite a bit of this um, project more from the 82. Uh, this is a drawing by Christo. Um, and Christo and Jean-Claude, husband and wife team, did these sort of speculative uh, landscape, but not quite architecture projects. But they're interesting because they're kind of provisional in, in nature. Um, and I was thinking about just the simple materials to demarcate space. And even looking at other uh, Christo and Jean-Claude projects, we can see here in Running Fence, uh, just the, the very... Uh, straightforward means of construction to define a radical territory, large scale, but incredibly efficient and uh, straightforward means of assembly. So this might be a beginning of inspiration. It also just reminds me of sails that are of course part of uh, the use of the waterfront and literally here, just how the sail the boat is on shore, but we have essentially a, a wall, a triangulated wall made out of uh, canvas that just demarcates space. So these are sort of inspirations that I'm thinking about how we too might build a provisional area, much larger in ambition uh, because of low tech, affordable, fast to assemble materials. And the history of fast assembly, low tech. Also, it's not just to the sails themselves, but here is an example of Ward's Island um, from 1911, where people just built very simple canvas frame buildings um, in the summertime months. So perhaps it's here, the, the kind of as a discussion between wood frame construction, the wood slats and the tar paper, more permanent, even though this is provisional, up against the even easier to assemble uh, canvas tent. We can look to other contemporary uh, examples too, the simple frame construction and something tethered like here, yarn to just form the larger structure, larger ambition. Or Doho Sa's recent installation in the Netherlands, or how artists have often sort of used materials in innovative ways to create larger shapes, planes. Or an earlier example of my own work, uh, co-designed and built trellis structure in an urban garden, where you can just, you're reading the structure, but it's meant to, to be uh, semi-transparent. Um, so there it is in construction. Um, it could be that we're not thinking of sheathing. I think this is really kind of a, a question to work collaboratively um, as a group to discuss moving forward. But in the meantime, just to conclude, we will be working closely with the Toronto Island Community Association to, to find our site. And I think the spirit really is to be collaborative and to be knowing that it's temporary and provisional, our structure. We're going to propose something that would perhaps help just envision what a future uh, along the, the, the northern shore looking to Toronto uh, might be in the future. I think that that's about 10 minutes because I wanted to make sure I didn't talk too, too long. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe, that's very exciting. Um, 
and uh, imagine you might have questions, but it's it would be good to save them for the end. So I'll, uh, I'll pass it on to Robert. Sounds good. Thanks, Petros. That was a wonderful presentation, Chloe. I want to take your studio. Let me share my screen here. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah, perfect. Thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I recognize some of the names here. Uh, I'm Robert. I just finished my master's of architecture around about a year or so ago um, from, uh, from Daniels and I did my undergrad here too. Uh, and I'm really excited to share this proposal for a design build studio with everyone. I call it circularity of people in place. Um, I, I would, if you were all in person, to ask for a show of hands to see who knows what the term circular economy means, uh, or if you've heard that before. Um, and But since I can't quite see, oh, I see a hand was raised. Yay. All right. Um, circular economy means it's about the, the sharing, reusing, and repurposing of materials to avoid waste and the consumption of brand new products. Um, you know, when we think about architecture and we think about building things, we think about making things, anything at all that we create, we're creating things using materials. These materials were at the very start of their lives, they were extracted from the earth in some capacity. Um, I work in uh, for an architect run uh, building firm called TAS. And uh, these are two less attractive slides, but that were part of a presentation I gave to my staff um, talking about this, this subject, so I, I thought I would bring them in to, to share, you know, the status quo of making buildings, uh, anything, any building, but any structure really, um, on a site where there's existing things that are already there, uh, begins with the demolition of those things. You know, if you see, you see an old building and you, you see a fence put up around it, oh, we're going to build lots of housing in this place, in, in a city. Um, what will typically happen is whatever was previously there will be knocked down kind of uh, aimlessly, those materials will be put onto dump trucks and they'll be taken off, taken away off of the site. Then there's this, if you can see my cursor, there's this kind of hard stop where the, build, the, the site sits empty. And then people come in and they say, okay, this empty site, we're now going to create some sort of, of building on this site. Typically if in, in cities and in, in areas where housing is necessary, it'll be a large multi-unit housing complex or something. And so this is something that uh, is really, this is common. This happens all throughout the city of Toronto, wandering around campus and kind of in, even just in the streets surrounding uh, U of T downtown, you'll see this on a regular basis. This is the status quo. What I think the city of Toronto is slowly moving towards and inspired by places around the world is something called circularity. And so rather than uh, taking an existing building and just knocking it all down, it's taken apart. And the materials that come out of it, they have, there's, they're recognized, they're respected for what they are. They're cataloged, they're put into a list, and we know We seem to, we seem to have lost Robert. Hopefully he'll uh, check in with us again. <laughs> As we fill in the time, waiting for him to reconnect, his screen seems to be okay. Well, um, you can see that our studios, and as they will keep being described both by Robert and Nicholas and, and his uh, collaborators in his uh, design build project, oh, they're his, have a strong critical take as well, right? Um, design build includes both designing and thinking and, and, and kind of uh, documenting and recognizing a place as well as going into the process of, of making. Hello, so, I'm back. Okay. Apologies for that. I don't know what happened. Just MC and waiting for you to come back. Oh, that's very sweet. Thank you. Um, okay. So um, 
and yeah, thank you, Patrick. And apologies for the for that, everyone. I uh, my the one day I'm not in Toronto, I'm in my car in Peterborough. But anyway, um, so yeah, there's these buildings. The sites are always full of material. There's no no sense in bringing new bricks back to a place when the existing bricks can be reused. Um, and I've done a fair bit of research on on the topic of circularity and gone on on several kind of excursions. I took these photos this fall um, in the Netherlands. Uh, and there were several really interesting, fascinating projects that were being built. And kind of there were two categories of, of projects. Uh, the building at the top, the top three photos of, this, of one project, uh, which is actually a bank uh, created by an architecture firm called Rao Architects. And what makes this project really interesting is that the materials that are put into this are designed to be taken apart. So at the end of this building's life, if it's deemed no longer useful and 60 years and 80 years, this beautiful building can be dismantled very easily. There are no, there's no glue in the joints um, and everything can be taken apart. All of the material can be salvaged and reused. And beyond that, there's a big list of all of the materials that went into this building. So they know exactly how many pieces of wood, how many pieces of plywood, how many um, panels of glass and the sizes of all of them are, are in this, this place. Uh, and it can all be kind of repurposed down the line. The images on the bottom, um, the, the bottom left two, uh, are of a train station uh, that was built using reused materials. Um, and so all of these trusses that are on the, the roof structure here, these were originally Bailey bridges in World War II, uh, and they were turned into the, the roof structure of this, of this place. Uh, really amazing. Uh, the building on the right is actually a temporary building, also designed to be disassembled and reused in the future. Uh, and so these are some of the principles of circular economy and, and reuse and things that are coming to Toronto, but very slowly. And we want to help spread the word and kind of have a jump start on some of these ideas. The second topic that we'll talk about in the studio is placemaking. And placemaking is it's about the approach to the design, the transformation of public spaces that kind of focuses on, on local history, the culture of the place, the identity of the people who live there in that place, uh, with the ultimate focus of strengthening the connection between the people who are somewhere and the somewhere itself. Um, and there's many different ways that this can, can be done in cities. These six photos are photos um, from projects that TAS has done where I uh, where I tend to where I work these days, uh, of different installations. You know, some of them are, uh, they can be a community market. It can be an art installation um, by like a local indigenous artist on the doors of a church. It can be uh, a community garden uh, for local residents who don't have access to healthy food and need healthy food. It can be uh, a video installation on a site that was, uh, where that movie was filmed. It can be uh, a sacred fire. It can be a children's playground made out of trees that were felled in the city of Toronto. There's a real range of things that can kind of, one can do to bring the community together and give them a sense of a, an understanding and a connection of, of where they are. And circular economy and placemaking have something in common. Both of them are, it's a recognition and a respect of what has been what exists already, all the effort and the time that's been put into the things that are, are being made to guide what will be. And in this light, um, I'm sure everyone's heard, you know, talks about gentrification and the idea of cities kind of changing over time. And as we grow and densify our cities to accommodate people, um, there's this very real risk of disconnecting from the land, disconnecting from people of a place. And placemaking is what counters this. Placemaking is the opposite of that. It's a thing that can help hold some of these things together. Um, so this design build studio proposes, uh, TAS has a site in the city of Toronto um, where a future housing project is going to be built. The site has a very rich history. Uh, it was an industrial space for a long time. It was an artist space for a long time. Uh, the building was structurally unsound and was taken down to be made uh, a future housing project. There's going to be about 200 kind of live work units for, uh, for folks to move into. Um, but until that time, the site sits empty. And I'm sure many of you have wandered by a big empty field and think all oh, those developers who just leave big empty spaces, what they should be doing is they should be activating these spaces and bringing a community together and understanding the place to create something special. And so at DuPont and Ossington, which is where this site will be located, um, 
we're proposing, I'm proposing a design build installation. And so this will be something that uh, all of you who take this course, we'll do community days where we kind of consult with the local neighborhood. We get an understanding of the history of the site, what the, the locals of this place in downtown Toronto want and need right now that they don't have access to and be able to create something that directly benefits them for the next couple of years until this project is built. Um, we're also going to have a men menu of material choices, uh, reused products, reused reclaimed wood, reclaimed brick uh, from this exact building and from a couple of other buildings that TAS has as well. Um, and understanding the history of these materials and where they came from can help kind of influence. We have the history of the site, we have the history of the materials. These can all help influence the design. Um, and finally, we'll be challenge I'll be challenging everyone to make a design that's demountable, which is something that can be easily taken apart to be moved at a future date and prolong the uh, the longevity of this uh, of this project. Uh, so ultimately it's a it's a design build studio that takes place right in the heart of downtown. Uh, it's about collaboration with the local neighborhood, a respect of what is, uh, and an understanding. We'll learn about what placemaking means. We'll have experts on circularity and the carbon footprint of materials coming in to talk about some of these things and the benefit of reusing materials from a um, carbon footprint and sustainability viewpoint. Um, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Robert. Again, very exciting. Um, and, and looking forward to everything that will happen this summer. Um, I, I think we're on schedule. And um, Nicholas is next. Sure, just give me a second to set up, share my screen here, Petros. And I believe Ariane uh, Rosé Rad is also here from uh, Civil Engineering, who will be one of the co-runners of the design build with myself and Annalisa Mabu, who unfortunately could not join us today because she's in a, another workshop currently. Um, share screen. One. Can everyone see this? We're good? All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Nicholas Hoban. Also in the call is Ariane Rosé Rad. Uh, we are bringing the robot made design build to the University of Toronto for the first time. Uh, historically, this design build has been run at the UBC Sala School of Architecture in collaboration with the University of Waterloo and also the Center for Advanced Wood Processing at uh, UBC as well. Um, sorry, I don't know why that's not advancing. So, It'll be a pairing of essentially three, two different departments at the University of Toronto, plus one additional institution, um, which will bring a really interesting wealth of kind of expertise and knowledge into a territory that is rapidly growing in which architects um, are communicating directly to design fabrication technology. How do we actually start to shorten the gap between our computation and fabrication tools uh, to the fabricated outcome? And through that, we're gonna ask the question, how can we use computational tools to challenge conventional methods of wood construction through design to digital fabrication felicitated through robotic systems? Uh, so our design build is heavily gonna focus on a few different components. One, looking at software and how our software, software integration tools allow us to design, build, analyze, and simulate to then parse out design data to fabricate. So, through myself, Annalisa, and Ariane, the students will be exposed to a variety of different plugins facilitated through Rhinoceros, um, looking at Grasshopper, uh, Compass, FEA, and Compass Timber, of which Ariane is one of the key writers, uh, and then parsing out all of our design and geometry data to KUKA PRC to run robotic control and fabrication itself. Um, so this is very much gonna be a hands-on design build in which students will experience both the software end hardware integration through to fabrication um, for kind of a data flow of material logic, understanding design constraints, uh, understanding systems control and understanding how to use kind of advanced fabrication and how architecture begins to um, shorten this gap, how we can begin to understand and communicate with these tools. Uh, so for teaching, we have a set of a couple of criteria that is really the goal of the design build. 
is to start thinking through advanced parametric timber design through uh, rhinoceros grasshopper through PRC, uh, a dedicated day to structural performance analysis through Compass Timber and up at Compass FEA, which Ariane will be leading from structural engineering, um, a number of days dedicated to a digital and robotic fabrication control. So all students will be engaging with the KUKA robotic system as a milling cell, understanding how our design data goes from the computer all the way to uh, control integration. And then the implications of this, like how do we get to think about design constraints within this digital environment and how our material systems begin to actually affect this digital environment as well. Uh, so we're gonna to begin to understand design manufacturing and assembly, robotic operations and robotic code, tolerances and precision within design and materials, structural forces and connection systems, which will be heavily facilitated by Ariane, um, implications of parametric design and, pre and precision and instructions for assembly integrated design. Um, and what we mean by all of this is that there's an embedded logic in the computational tools we use today. And how do we imbue that logic into the fabricated components that allow for ease of on-site assembly? Um, so our schedule we, will be kind of as such. The first three days are really going to be dedicated to uh, bringing all the students on board with all the tools and systems that we use uh, through comprehensive uh, workshops and tutorials, looking at the data flow and design for manufacturing assembly. Uh, Ariane will be leading a day-long tutorial and kind of integration of Compass FEA and Compass Timber. How do we get to actually structurally analyze uh, within Grasshopper? We will do a whole day on Grasshopper tools and KUKA PRC. How do we simulate robotic control and actually understand how to utilize it? And then data four to five in the first week will be practical uh, KUKA robotics demos. So all the students are gonna learn hands-on how to actually operate the equipment and machines, understanding safety protocols, uh, how do we actually utilize these machines and how we begin to integrate them in this design for manufacturing and assembly process. Uh, and then the second week will be heavily dedicated to making our final structure. So three days of uh, heavy fabrication while we actually start to commence what we know as prefabrication or assembly of the building. And then final assembly uh, on site, which is gonna be a chosen site yet to be TBD of the final structure itself. Um, historically, um, at the Center for Advancement Processing, uh, Robot Bay has been led by Annalisa Mayboom, uh, David Cray, and Oliver David Krieg, uh, both from Waterloo and from uh, Oliver Lang Architects. This year, Annalisa has graciously agreed to bring the design builds to the University of Toronto. Uh, so working in collaboration, we begin to investigate doubly curved um, shell structures and how we can actually fabricate them utilizing robotic fabrication. There's a really rich history to this design build having taken place at UBC for at least five or six sessions at this point in time, uh, involving both students and industry partners. Um, and they begin to research how do connection assemblies begin to work, um, how do material constraints begin to work, and how do we actually realize some of these structures from the computational model to uh, on-site assembly. Um, so these are some of the past projects that have been completed at UBC. Um, and as you can all see, they're very complex. They all sit under double curvature. Um, so all students will be able to engage with kind of the design model, structural analysis model, and how does that data flow go directly towards fabrication technology? Uh, I think everyone might've seen this one on the, the posting of the Wanderwood uh, from 2018 itself. Um, myself, I typically, some students that might know me, I work a lot in discrete uh, reciprocal timber frame uh, construction. So among the three of us, it's a very interesting um, co-op, I will call it. Uh, and Elisa typically works in doubly curved um, wood shell structures. I typically work in reciprocal frame structures and Ariane's work, which you'll see in a minute, works also in kind of plate material structures. So the three of us together will be leading this design build to really start to bridge the gap between these advanced manufacturing methods uh, and disseminate this knowledge to the students, because this is really where it needs to be taught so that students going forward have this skill set and this knowledge base to carry forward both into architecture and into industry. Uh, Ariane, I think the next slide is yours. Did you want to jump on? And I can skip ahead on the slides. You can keep the presentation and we'll describe it.
Okay. Well, hello everyone. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Uh, my name is Ariane, Professor of Civil Engineering at the rank of Assistant, Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering, Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering. And it's really be great to be in front of and working with architects. That's fantastic. And um, although I had this experience to work with architects for many years back in Switzerland, but uh, as Nicolas said, this is the first time actually we are bringing this new idea and project to U of T and to, I would say, Ontario. And uh, I would be more than happy to participate and uh, uh, play a role as an instructor. My main role is, as Nicolas said, uh, supporting uh, the project from structural engineering point of view and how, uh, simply put, force, form, and material are all integrated with each other. I have an experience in working with uh, plate systems and reciprocal systems. So uh, this is one of the uh, flagship projects we've done back in Switzerland under the supervision of Evinant at uh, EPFL uh, in, in Lausanne. Uh, the project was a part of uh, knowledge and technology transfer initiative. Uh, where multiple scientists uh, work together, uh, together with engineers and architects. Uh, the project consists of 23 uh, different freeform double layer, double curved arches made out of planar segmented timber plates connected by means of carpentry with wood connections, all fabricated by five axis CNC or six axis robotic arms. Uh, and uh, many parts of the engineering design from the computational part was carried out using uh, Compass, Compass FEA, uh, and uh, finite element analysis, which uh, realistically reflect the 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 actual mechanical and structural behavior of uh, such complex timber systems. And uh, my intention is basically bring that knowledge to some extent uh, to our to our students uh, here at U of T, and uh, make them basically aware of how force flows from one element to another and how structural performance. Uh, is 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 uh, um, conducted uh, within this context. I guess that's pretty much it, Nicolas. If do we have other? I have uh, the ending video. So um, uh, because Robot made his run for a number of years at UBC, uh, Annalisa has graciously shared a video that I'll now play, kind of highlighting one of the previous sessions, so students can understand what to expect over the course of the two weeks. Industrial robots are changing the way we make virtually everything, from the manufacturing of computer chips to the way we make cars. Robots aren't the whole story. How data is created, collected, and interpreted has fundamentally changed the way we live. And now, those same changes are happening in construction. want to build more precise buildings that function better, that work better, that meet energy codes. We've got to build at a precision level that's hard to do with a skill saw and a, and a nail gun on a site when it's raining. Using robotics that allows us to assemble more pieces and more complex pieces that in totality result in higher performing building performance. Architects and engineers now have access to powerful parametric software that can create and analyze complex geometries. When parametrics take you great control of the geometry, the next challenge is moving it into construction. Because you need the accuracy in construction to be the same as the accuracy in the geometry that you have in the design. At the Center for Advanced Wood Processing in Vancouver, researchers from the University of British Columbia and the University of Waterloo are working with Intelligent City a local leader in mass timber construction to make robotic fabrication more accessible. This is what can be designed on paper or the software and what is actually We're looking at very free form terms of curvy and expressive geometries, but it's very much the same as we're to design the comps. Now, what's really cool about this computation, of course, is that we can manipulate it by change that house and not pay by 10 meters, all of those 
elements are also correlated to that, so they will adjust according to the center on each select that will do an alliance of the center of that house. Normally, this is something that would be designed, it's called associative design or parametric design, but here we're also putting that in fact, so we can take that more digitally and put it apply in a way that they can manufacture it. Robotic communication is not only meant to automate existing processes, but to augment what we can do and further to introduce new processes that were not possible previously. Uh, thank you, everyone. I think Ariane, myself, and Annalise are very excited to be bringing this work to U of T um, as a collaborative uh, event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ariane, and nice to meet you. And thank you, Nicholas. Um, also very exciting, and I think I think it seems like this summer is a special time, uh, also because of the range of the different projects and and all the people involved in them. So I. I think it's going to be great. Um, it's going to be great to have you at the faculty and to test some of these things near or far um, in this for, for all our design build studios. So um, now is the time for questions. If um, there are any that are not answered already by the instructors or by me, um, we're happy to stay here and and try and, and yeah give you some answers. I am immediately also uploading the link to the uh, summer course descriptions again, just bringing it down on this chat and the dates. So that's where all the information is. And just also reminding everyone that February 19th, the end of day, February 19th is really the time by which you have to submit your application and express your interest in participating in these courses. Any questions? So there's a question about taking two summer courses simultaneously that are offered at the same time. Um, there are two ways to do that. Really, I mean, you cannot take the Athens course and Nicholas's course because you cannot be at two places at the same time. So the travel courses uh, or the Berlin course and uh, Robert and Chloe's course uh, or the Costa Rica course and Robert and Chloe's. Uh, so the travel courses can physically not be taken at the same time. Um, I think... The easiest answer is no, because um, design research internship that is also offered uh, during the same term requires a kind of daily uh, presence at the firms, uh, if not by daily. So scheduling will be tricky. And because these courses are also meant to be intensive, um, there's different uh, levels of contact time. I think Nicholas's and Arian's and Annalisa's courses is really happening in a very short and intensive period. I think Chloe's course uh, is spread out over three weeks. That includes some uh, time to document uh, and, and visit place. And then Robert's, I think, maybe half a week longer than that. Um, but uh, I think it's not going to be very easy to take two of these courses simultaneously because the level of engagement and energy required will be there. It may be possible to take one course back to back with another course. So if a course ends at a certain time uh, and the other one begins right after it, I think it may be possible. Um, there is another factor there which has to do with, we want to make sure that you all have access to courses. So if you already enrolled in a course and there's a waiting list in another course, and you're part of that waiting list, there will probably be other students that it would be fair to offer access to that course if that's their only course. You see what I mean? So um, I think you can request this and you can note this in your application and we can see through your, your notes. There have been students that last summer took, I think a couple of courses, but not simultaneously. 
Uh, that's really a question of three places. But in general, I my guess is that it will be difficult to take them at the same at the same time, um, especially since there will be scheduling overlap. I hope this answers your questions, Daniela. Um, and I will be repeating some of the next questions coming in. Um, how would you like you would we like you to format your portfolio submission okay five work samples right you can call it portfolio you can call it five work samples uh you're you are required and you can see the requirements to submit a short statement a cv and five work samples so all these three things i have to look on the the format i think it's a fun it's a question of the fo of the form so if you visit the form there will probably be there is a kind of um uh size limit for the work samples and i think you, you submit them in subsequent pages um uh, pdfs i think is what they all are so there will probably be consecutive pages in one pdf but you will i think i think you can find the answer of that in the application form I don't know, Tina, if you want to add anything that I might be forgetting here, but in terms of the actual format of the submissions. Um, their file uploads um, button for you to upload your files, one for a CV, one for a statement of interest, and one for your web samples. If you have more than one uh, courses that you're applying and you would like to indicate which one for which course, please write down the course code on each page that you're applying to and combine them into one file to upload it. There's the file size on the form indicated. If I remember correctly, it should be 10 megabytes. So uh, just try to upload. If it's too large, try to compress them and upload them. Just as general advice, it's always better to submit fewer images than many, many very small images. Um, and yes, so last year we did not have a kind of requirement for you to submit the work samples for the design builds. This year we've made the same requirements for all courses because they're all part of the same applications. And you don't have to see it necessarily as this competitive kind of process where you have to win over the others by having the best portfolio. It's really about us having a sense of like who you are and what your interests are uh, to, to make sure the, ma the match is right. Um, and you will have opportunities to uh, access more than one course. So we do want the CV statement and five Work samples also for the design build. Yes, and there was I think there was a question I I received on a separate channel. Any questions to our instructors? Any questions about? Uh, I think there is another question from Julia about uh, the cost for taking each design build course. Um, so basically, uh, you pay tuition for the summer courses. The, whatever your 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 tuition is as a domestic or international student, there this subdivides to the cost per credit or per half credit that you will be taking this summer. Um, we do not, I mean, and you have to physically be present in Toronto at that time. So whatever your living arrangement is, you, you need to be able to support that. But we, um, in our in our summer travel courses, we come up with a budget because you have to get flights and calculate uh, living in a, in a city abroad uh, for two or three weeks and also have a kind of uh, ballpark figure for the food you spend. We don't do the same process for Toronto because you already live in Toronto and you have to calculate maybe your living costs uh, in the city if you are not regularly planning to be in Toronto. So you have to physically be here and that is on you to work out. Uh, for the duration of the course. So again, I pasted the dates of each course uh, just up in the chat at 12.44 p.m. And that's on you to organize. 
It's really to issue and leave it costs. Thank you. Okay, I will uh, wait maybe for one more minute in case anything else trickles in. Um, and we can call it a day for now. And we look forward to receiving your applications and please uh, refer your classmates to the website if you know there were, oh, question for Robert came in. Yes, I can send that in the chat here. I'm going to double check what it was called, but I will forward its name. Uh, here we go. It is the Triodos Bank Building. I'm going to put that in here. Um, can I make one very quick comment that is something I forgot to add during my little presentation, Petrus? Um, I don't know if I made it super clear to everyone, but we will be building this structure, whatever the, the structure is that we designed for this site during the three and a half weeks. And we'll be building it at Daniel's and we'll be installing it on site as well. And so everyone who's part of the studio will be a part of that process. Thanks for clarifying. It sort of goes without saying, but it always helps to make it clear. Okay, a bunch of questions coming in. I was about to, to call the auction, but, but there's more. Uh, yes, you you need to submit five work samples uh, and the CV and statement of interest to joining this course. And the Berlin Studio Abroad course has its own special requirements, um, which you need to adjust your submission to. Um, and uh, there's a comment from Arian that Students should not be worrying about the engineering challenges for the robot project. Um, he just sent me that. Um, that this support is really provided by your instructors and it's a real chance to, to learn about this process as well. Um, the CAPS, the, the number of students in each design build section are being currently decided. Uh, I think the shortest version would be 12 students. The largest version would be 15 or a few more. Um, we want to make these courses available to all of you or as many of you. So um, as an opportunity, we will also be offering them every summer uh, in case you, you know, you want to plan uh, if, if you're a you know, student really going into your third year and you have another summer to think about what you may want to take. Uh, but yes, the, the caps are around 15 uh, in most courses with, with exceptions uh, or a few less. And uh, that's similar to the study abroad courses as well. Um, the design research internship, we're trying to expand it, enlarge it to as many students as possible. So that's, that's the figure. All right. Is there information regarding the duration of each course? Yes, there is. I've pasted it up on this chat and we can also find it in the link of the courses. But you also need to know the number of hours per session as well as whether these sessions are scheduled on weekdays. Uh, I think that the, the sessions are primarily scheduled on weekdays. If there is a build section that is near the end of the project, maybe I can allow the instructors to answer that, but uh, um, we will be posting or figuring out contact times at a later date. So uh, this will really be part of the, of the syllabus of the course. Uh, for the shorter courses, there is an expectation that there will be at least 36 uh, contact hours. Um, and you can break that up by the number of days. It is often turns out to be more because especially when you're in the in the building phase, that requires uh, you know uh, involvement. And um, but this would be a question also to address to your instructor. The actual times 
uh, and schedule will be provided nearer uh, the beginning of class. I don't know if any of you have any further answer to how many hours per week or um, how often these courses will be expected to, to meet daily or over weekdays or weekends? I can speak a little bit to the my plan, at least for uh, for the circularity build. Um, the My intention right now is to have it run Mondays to Thursdays between um, the 9th and August 1st. Uh, and it would be three to four days within each of those blocks for approximately half a day um, of kind of like instructor contact time uh, in there uh, per, per day. Uh, for ours, we definitely are not running on weekends, uh, but the day times will be pretty extensive. Like I think we're probably anticipating either a 9 to 10 a.m. start to probably 5 o'clock every day uh, because there's quite a bit of knowledge dissemination and work uh, involved. So, uh, yeah, it'll be intensive, but a lot of fun. I haven't decided yet. Um, but probably for us uh, to beat the tourists, it will be a Monday to Friday, generally, just less, less busy on the ferries. I hope this answers the scheduling question um, and gives you a context, especially if you're working at the same time or have other concurrent plans, very much understandable. Um, it's really nice to... Uh, to do a design build project in Toronto during the summer. It's really something that, uh, it's a nice way to be in the city, to work in the city, to be at the Daniels faculty, which is a, is gonna be a very different vibe to what it currently is during the fall and winter terms. Uh, really special. I, I want to take the design builds myself. I never had the chance to, but um, if I were you, I would definitely look into it. All right, so if you have any further questions, you can email the instructors individually uh, or myself or the Office of the Registrar and Student Services, especially for logistics, and we'll be answering them in good time. Thank you for joining us and for participating in this section. Uh, thank you to the instructors. And we look forward to sorting everything out getting ready and uh, rolling out this really exciting program this summer. Good to see you all. Okay, thank you, Petros. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. Thank you very much, folks. Looking forward to seeing you in the summer. Thank you, Petros. Thank you, everyone.